Today, I'm going to show you the basics of using custom HLSL code in Unreal and Unity. Let's go. Both Unreal and Unity have a node in their shader editor that allows you to use your own custom HLSL code. In Unreal, it's just called custom. They both work pretty similarly. The idea is that you can write code in HLSL and include it in your graph. There are a couple of reasons that you might want to do this. First, to reduce the amount of spaghetti in your graph. You can represent complex formulas with just a little bit of code instead of dozens of nodes. And so if you want to compress a lot of uh, graph logic into just a single node, you can use a custom code node. Second, if someone gives you a bunch of HLSL code that you want to use, so for example, if you find a function on the web or a teammate hands you a function that you need to use in your shader, you can just copy and paste it into a custom code node uh, instead of trying to go through the process of translating it into a node graph instead. And then finally, you might want to use a custom code node to get around the limitations of a node of node based shader creation. So for example, there are some things that aren't possible to do uh, using nodes that you can do uh, with a custom code node. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So first, let's take a look at the custom code node in Unreal. And then later on, we'll switch over to Unity and I'll show you how to do the same thing there. So this is our custom code node and we can just right click in here and type custom and it comes right up. And the first thing that I wanna do is go over the options. Um, so if we select our, our node here, you can see that uh, the first box that we get in the, in the uh, details panel down here is for our code. And right now, uh, this is basically the most basic code you can write. So our code just says one and it's returning one, and that means it's white. And if we change this to zero, uh, now it's returning black because that's zero. So we're giving it either zero or one, and our code is running correctly, and it's giving us the result. So we'll just wire this into our base color uh, on our root node there, and you can see that now it's giving us a color of white. And again, we can change this to black, and it's giving us a color of black. All right, so here we define the output type. And so we have several different options, float one, float two, float three, float four, and material attributes. Um, but we're just gonna leave that on float three uh, for now, which means it's giving us a value uh, that is a color. Uh, we're getting R, G, and B as our output. If we wanna actually make this a color instead of just a single value, I can type the word float and then some parentheses. And now I can give it an R, a G, and a B value. So I'm gonna give it a one for the red channel, a zero for the green channel, and a zero for the blue channel. So here I've got float one, uh, zero, zero. I'm sorry, I need to make this a float three. There we go. And now I'm specifying one for red and zero for green and blue. And so we're getting a red color, makes sense, right? And if I give it uh, one for the green channel, now I'm getting red one and green one, which gives me yellow. And if I give it a one for the blue channel, now I'll get white because I'm giving it a one in all three channels. Uh, and this can keep going, you know, we can have all kinds of fun putting in different colors, but. Um, this is how it works if you want to output a color. Uh, next, I have a description. And this is just the word that shows up on the top of my box here. Uh, custom is fine for now, but if you have, uh, if you've entered some interesting code here and you want to give that code a name, uh, you can name your function there, my custom function, and it'll show up just like that. All right, next we have our inputs. And right now you can see I have an array of inputs. 
and my first one shows up here uh, with a name of none. You can see I have an input there on the right. Uh, if I delete this, now my custom function has no inputs, um, but I need inputs, so let's make uh, an input here. And if I open this up, you can see it gives me a slot for defining the name for my input. And I can just call this whatever I want, my input. And it shows up right there. Now you can see I'm, I've got an error. And the reason that I have an error is because I have an input with no connection. So if I wanna hold down one and click, it'll give me a value. And now I can connect that into my input and my error goes away. Uh, custom uh, custom code nodes need their inputs connected uh, or else they like to complain with errors. Now, if I actually wanna use this value, you can see here I've named it my input. And if I copy this and paste it up here, now it's gonna be using my input. And so I can change my input to one and now you can see I've got my input showing up over here, or I could change it to 0 0.5. And it's giving me gray. I gave it a value of 0 0.1. There we go. So it got a value of dark gray. So it's basically just taking what I'm passing in uh, to this input here and outputting the value as my input. All right, let's do some, some things that are a little bit more interesting. Another thing that you can do with the custom node here is you can use basic uh, HLSL intrinsic functions. Uh, so over here, I've got the term lerp and A, B, and T. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this code. I'm just going to paste lerp, A, B, and T. And now you can see uh, my render ball here has turned the default gray checkerboard. Anytime you see that, it means your code is not working correctly um, because you're not getting any good result. And so what I need to do here is I have defined these terms A, B, and T, and these are uh, inputs, but I haven't actually created them down here. So I'm gonna define some inputs now, A, and I'll add another one and we'll call it B. And I'll add another one and we'll call it T. All right, so now I've got my A, B, and T inputs. And I'm using a, uh, a lerp here, which is the same as the linear interpolate node. So there's my uh, linear interpolate and my custom version of that. I'm gonna change the custom name here just to lerp. So now that I know I've got this lerp code in here and I've defined my values A, B, and T. So let's just go ahead and fill in some values for that. Uh, we'll give ourselves a couple of colors here. Maybe we'll make this one kind of red and plug it in. And we'll copy and paste another one. Boy, in uh, Unreal 5.1, some of these nodes have gotten really big. Uh, let's go ahead and make this one blue. And we'll plug it in. And now we need to blend between red and blue. So I'm just going to give myself a value here and plug it in as well. Maybe we'll give it a value of 0 0.5. And now what you're going to see is I'm blending between zero or between red and blue with a value of 0 0.5. So I get a nice uh, medium mix, which gives me purple. And so what I've done here with my custom node is I basically just exactly copied the functionality of the built-in lerp node with uh, my custom uh, HLSL node. Now I could do some more advanced things here. Like I could multiply this by 0 0.5 and make it darker. Maybe multiply it by 0 0.1 and make it even darker. Uh, maybe I can add uh, three and now it's gonna be a lot brighter. So I can just keep going and continue to add more math here uh, and I can build this up. Whereas here I would have to do that with, uh, with nodes if I were gonna do it outside uh, my custom node.
All right, there are a lot of built-in intrinsic functions that you can use like this. Uh, I've shown you that you can use the term lerp here, but you can also use min, max, saturate, clamp, abs for the absolute. Um, so a lot of the nodes that you're already familiar with in the shader in the graph here, you can use similar terms uh, as intrinsic functions in HLSL code here. And I'll put a link down in the description uh, to a site where you can find out what all of these terms are. So um, when you find uh, nodes in the shader editor, clamp or seal or uh, smooth step, all of these nodes can be uh, created in HLSL as well. So you can create them um, using this custom node. All right, let's take a look at another example. Let's say that I want to sample a texture. How do I do that? Well, I've written the code for sampling a texture right here. So I'm just going to grab this and copy and paste it in. But let's see what we get. So obviously we're getting an error here because we've defined A, B, and T. But the inputs that we need now are called text and UV. And we don't need this last one, so I'm just going to get rid of it. Now, obviously, I need to fill in these uh, input uh, ports that I've just created. So with the first one, I'm going to create a texture object, which will allow me to pick a texture. And we'll plug that into our text input. And then for the second one, for UV, I need to add a texture coordinate node. And we'll plug our texture coordinates into that. And now you can see I'm sampling my texture. So I'm using my custom code node here to create a texture sampler. And you can see I've got uh, this code here. It says texture 2D sample text, which is the name of my input texture object. And then text sampler, which is the name of the sampler that's being used to sample the texture. And then UV, and that's the name of my input port here which I'm using to pass in my UV coordinates. All right, let's get a little bit more advanced and take a look uh, at this code here. This is the point where we're getting to the spot where we're going to do something that can't be done in the regular uh, node based editor. And that is a for loop here. So you can see I've got this code uh, and you can see this term here for and what this is doing is it's uh, looping over the code that's inside these brackets multiple times. And so this is how you set up a for loop in HLSL. And it's going to loop through this uh, uh, loop and redo this code as many times as I tell it to. So let me first explain what's happening here. And uh, then we'll paste in this code and take a look at how it actually behaves. So in my for loop, I'm defining an integer and I'm naming it i. Wait, let me step back just a minute. When I do something like this, when I say float t equals zero, what I'm really doing is creating a box. I'm creating a box that I can put some data in. And in order to create the box, I need to tell it how big the box is and what the name of the box is. So when I say float, that's how big the box is. It's a box that has one container for something in it. I can also say float two, and now I've said my box has two containers in it. I can say float three, and I can say float four. Float three is like a color, for example, that has R, G, and B, so it needs three different components. And so I have to define the size of the box, the name of the box, and then with this equal sign here, I'm putting something into the box. So my so box size, my box name, and what my box contains. So that's how that code works. And then that's how that code works. And then all of my lines of code need to end with a semicolon here. The ones that I've created up here so far don't have a semicolon and uh, Unreal is just kind of handling that for me. But once I get to the point where I'm going to start putting in multiple lines of code, 
I need to end each of my lines with a semicolon so that the compiler knows, hey, stop here, and the next line is going to be something new. So that's what the semicolon here at the end means. All right, so back to the for loop. I'm setting up an integer, that's the size of the box, and I'm naming it i, and then I'm putting something in it which is zero. So I have a new integer uh, with a value of zero. And now I'm saying, I'm gonna continue looping through this code as long as i uh, is less than four. And then in each time I do the loop, I'm doing i++. Plus plus. And this plus just means add one more value to my, my integer i. So I'm gonna do this code inside the brackets as long as i is less than four. And so what this is gonna do is it's gonna loop through this four times. Um, each time, so i is gonna start out as zero. So the first time it's gonna be zero. Then the next time it's gonna be one. Then the next time it's gonna be two. Then the next time it's gonna be three. And once it gets to three, the next time it gets to here, it's gonna say, hey, uh, now I'm at four, so I can't do another one. All right, and then down here, and so each time it loops through, it's adding a value of 0.25 to my value of t, and then at the end, once it's done looping, it's gonna return my value of t. Now this return statement says, this is the value that's gonna be added to the output port. And so if we just look at this and kind of uh, reason through it, we start out with t uh, as a value of zero, and then each time we loop through this, we add 0 0.25 to t. That's what the plus equals means. It's saying take whatever t currently is and add 0.25 to it. So we're starting out with zero, and then t is going to be a value of 0 0.25. Then on my next loop, it's gonna be a value of 0 0.5, then on my next loop, it's gonna be as a value of 0.75 because we just keep adding 0.25 to it. And finally, the last time, it's gonna to get to a value of one. So we've logically reasoned through this and figured out that the result of all of this is going to be a value of one. Well, let's go ahead and test it. I'm just gonna delete my input nodes here and paste in my loop. And you can see that my code box expands now uh, so that I can include multiple lines. So there's the code I've written. I've defined a value of t, and I've returned a value of t. And obviously I'm getting errors here because uh, I have these outputs down here, text and UV, so I'll just hit this trash can icon to get rid of those. And now you can see that my code is returning a value of one because it's looping through this four times each time it's adding 0 0.25, and 0 0.25 times four is gonna give me one. If I want to, I can change the number of loops that I'm doing. If I set this to one, now it's only doing the loop once, and so I get a value of 0 0.25. I can set it to two, now it's doing the loop twice, so it's returning a value of 0.5. I can set it to three, and I can set it to four. All right, so there is my for loop. I'm looping through and uh, sampling, or uh, each time I'm looping, I'm incrementing this value just a little bit. All right, now what people usually wanna do with a for loop in their custom node here is they wanna sample textures. And the most common use for sampling textures uh, is some kind of blur. So you wanna do multiple, multiple texture samples and then average the results together. So we're gonna jump up in complexity here quite a bit. Um, so this is the new code that we're gonna be taking a look at. And so let's just kind of read through this and I'll explain what's happening. First, we're creating a new box called O and it's a float three, so we're gonna grab a color. We're gonna use our texture 2D sample function to sample our texture using the sampler and our UV. So this part we already went over. It should be pretty clear what's going on here in this line. 
And then we're going to do a for loop. And this time, instead of looping with a value that we've predefined, we're using this uh, input value of R. Well, let's go ahead and set up our input values here. Um, we need one input value called text. We need another input value called R, or UV, sorry. The next one's gonna be called R. And then the last one is gonna be called dist. And this is the distance uh, from the center. This is the amount of blur we're gonna be applying. All right, so we've got our inputs there and we need to go ahead and add a texture object. And we'll wire that in. Again, we need our UV coordinates. We need a value for R, which is gonna be the number of loops that we're gonna do. We'll just start off with one for now. And then we need a value for dist. And I'm gonna give this, uh, let's see, maybe a value of eight. So we'll wire these in. And um, now um, we're still returning a value of one here because we've got our self-contained function. But let me go ahead and copy and paste this code in instead. And instead of this default texture object, I'm gonna find something else to use. I think I wanna use uh, something with some, some polka dots in it. And I'm gonna change our preview object to a cube so it's a little bit more obvious what's happening here. Okay, so right now we've got some fairly sharp looking polka dots unless I zoom in too far. And that's because we're only setting our R value to one. So we're just doing one loop right now. Let's go ahead and turn up our loop here. Uh, we're gonna set this to eight. So we're jumping through our loop eight times. And I'm also gonna come down here and set our distance value to something a little bit more reasonable for what we need. I'm gonna set it to 0 0.001. Now you can start to see that our polka dots are getting just slightly blurry around the edges. I'm gonna turn this up to 16. And then I'm gonna set my distance uh, with a little bit larger value, maybe something like 0.05. And you can see that our polka dots are getting blurred kind of in this cross shape. Can you see that? If we turn this down maybe to four. Yeah, all right. Maybe go back up to 16. And maybe turn this distance down just a little bit, maybe 0 0.003. Yeah, so our function that we've pasted into our custom node is blurring our texture. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at what we're doing here. So. The first value that we're setting up here, the value of O, we're taking our texture sample of our texture. And then inside our for loop, we're saying, hey, we're gonna loop through this code uh, R times, and we've set our R value to 16. So we're gonna do whatever's inside these curly braces um, 16 times. So inside the curly braces, we're taking the value of O and we're doing four texture samples. These first two samples, here we're taking our UV coordinates and we're adding a new float, float two value that's using the value of I, so which loop we're on, times the distance. And so here we're adding to our U coordinate here we're subtracting from our U coordinate, and here we're adding to our V coordinate and subtracting to our subtracting from our V coordinate. So each of these is sampling our texture, and that new sample that we're doing is offset either up or down or left or right. And we're doing that the number of times that we set our R value to. And then here at the end, so we're adding all our samples together. So each time we sample, we're adding the new value to O. So O is just continuously accumulating its value. And then at the end, we're dividing O time with four times R because we're taking four samples here times R 
and that will give us, so this is gonna be 16 times four, which is 64, and we divide by that. And what that's doing is it's giving us the average value, and that's how blurring works. So we, we take all of these samples with our UV coordinates offset in different places, and then we average the value at the end. So we get a little bit of a blur. Pretty cool. Okay, so uh, don't worry because I'm gonna paste all of this uh, code down in the description so you can see uh, exactly what's going on. Basically, to sample a texture, we're giving it a texture object, we're giving it a texture sampler, and then we're giving it UV coordinates. Here are UV coordinates that we're passing in. Um, but then we're offsetting them um, based on a different distance, either left, right, up, or down. And then at the end, we're dividing our total um, by the total number, which gives us the average. All right, I do have one more example, and we're gonna go through this one fairly quickly um, because I wanna get over to Unity and show you how to do the same thing there. Um, one of the weaknesses of this particular blur feat, uh, function is that it only blurs left and right and up and down. And so um, once our blur size gets a, a little bit higher, uh, we start seeing this kind of plus shaped blur pattern. I can make it really obvious, you know, the higher this value gets. Um, instead of blurring kind of in a nice circular pattern, it's just blurring left, right, and up and down, and it's not very pretty to look at. And so what I've done is I've got, I've got some code here in my next version uh, that does a little bit better job of blurring in a circle. Uh, so let's switch over and take a look at that. So. I've got two for loops here. Here's my first for loop and here's my second for loop. This first one defines the number of directions. Uh, and so what that's doing is it's it's actually blurring in a circle. It's, it's taking samples all around in a circle and uh, the number of samples to, to create in that circle is defined by this directions input value. And then it's also doing multiple circles. And the number of circles to do is defined by this quality value. So if we take a look here, you can see that my custom, uh, my custom HLSL code has an input text texture object. It has my texture coordinates. It has directions. It has quality and then it also has uh, the size of the blur. And then down here at the bottom, it has text res, which is the, the resolution of the texture that I'm sampling. So it's really easy to see what's happening here. If I set my directions to four and I set my quality to one. So basically now it's showing that I'm taking four samples in one circle and a distance of eight. And if I increase this distance, what you're gonna see is my polka dots are now pulling apart and you can see the actual uh, samples that I'm taking. One at the top, one at the left, one at the right, one at the bottom, and also one at the center. So I'm doing one sample in the center plus four additional samples. Uh, and the higher I make this, uh, size value here, like if we turn it up to 32, you can see now the circles are very obvious. All right, so let's turn this back down and we'll turn our number of directions up to 16 and our quality up to three. And now you can see our polka dots are nice and fuzzy. So we're getting this really pretty um, blur pattern here from our uh, custom function that we've created in our custom code notes here. So let me just go through this code really quickly. This inner for loop uh, is determining how many circles of samples that I want to do. And this outer for loop is determining how many samples in that circle uh, are going to be created. And the way that the circle is set up is I've got my UV coordinates here and I'm adding cosine D and sine D, which is rotating those samples 
around uh, the circumference of the circle. And then I'm multiplying by my radius input times I, which is uh, the quality loop that I'm currently on. So basically we're setting up multiple circles, uh, one for each of the quality values here. And then we're setting up multiple samples around that circle. And then obviously down here at the end, we're averaging them all together. All right, I know this got pretty pretty advanced pretty quickly, but what I wanted to do today was just kind of give you an overview of the kinds of things uh, that you can do in a custom node like this. If there's some specific things that you'd like to see me do in HLSL in a custom node, let me know down in the comments. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this. Now we're gonna switch over to Unity and I'll show you how to use uh, the custom HLSL node there as well. All right, here we are in Unity, and we're gonna take a look at how to use the custom function node to add your own HLSL code into Shader Graph Shaders. So I'll hit the space bar to bring up the Create Node menu and just type custom and add a custom function node. And the way that this node works is you come over here to the Graph Inspector and you can control the input ports and the output ports right here. So the first thing that I need to do is add an output port and I'm gonna call it out and hit enter. And now what it's telling me, this little flag here says the source file does not exist. So in Unity, there's actually two different ways to define the HLSL code that you wanna use. You can either put it in an external file and reference that file right here where it says source, or you can switch this to string and this will allow you to type your code here uh, in the body box instead. So I'm gonna give my function a name here. I'm gonna call it my function. And now I can type my string. And what I need to do is I've got an output that says out, so I need to use that name. So I can say out equals one. And so now my shader is compiling. You can see that my output value or my preview here is set to one and I can just wire this right in. And now my preview window shows white. So out equals one. That's a basic HLSL shader. All right, let's try something a little bit more advanced. Let's set output to uh, vector three instead. And we're gonna make this a color. So I'm gonna set it to float three out equals float three one zero zero. All right, and then one zero zero obviously is gonna be red because the red channel has a one in it. And sure enough, um, when we set it to float three one zero zero, I get red as a result. Pretty cool. All right, so there are some intrinsic HLSL functions we can use, just like we did uh, in Unreal. Let's try using a lerp function. So I'm going to type lerp and then an open and close parentheses and I'll end my line with a semicolon. Now I need some values to lerp between. So I'm going to give myself an A, a B, and a T. And now it's not going to be happy because the A, B, and T values don't exist. So you can see I get my little flag there, undeclared identifier A. And so what I need to do is come up here to inputs and give myself an A input. We'll make it a, also a vector three. I'll give myself a B input. We'll make that a vector three. And I'll give myself a T input, and I'm gonna leave that one as a float. So now I can use my custom function node just like a lerp node. So I'm gonna add a couple of colors. And we'll make this one, let's make it green this time. And we'll plug that into A. And then we'll copy and paste it. And we'll make this one kind of a magenta. We'll plug that into B. And now I can use the value of T to blend between A and B. Yeah, pretty neat. And if I add a slider, I can actually interactively blend between these. So I'm gonna wire that into my T port. And when I move my slider back and forth, now, my custom function node here, because I've typed this code for lerp, my custom function node is behaving exactly the same as my lerp node does. 
So you can do all kinds of functions that way. And just like we did uh, in Unreal, we can also type additional code here. So if I want to darken my lerp, I could do like a multiply by 0 0.2. And now I've got a darker shade here. And I can just keep going on my merry way and maybe add plus uh, 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.2, just do lots of math in there, and it just keeps on going. Um, I can fit all of that on one line, or I can split it up and do more here down below. Well, let's say we want to, um, let's say we want to sample a texture. That is a little bit different um, than we did in Unreal. Uh, actually, let's, let's just scoot all of this over and create a new one. I'm just going to create a custom function node here. And in order to sample a texture, let's add uh, an out again. So we'll do a out and we'll make this a vector three. We're going to set it to string and this will be my texture sample. In order to sample a texture, we need to use this code right here, sample texture 2D. In Unreal, it was texture 2D sample, um, but in Unity, it's sample texture 2D. And this is a macro that uh, has been created um, to make sampling textures a little bit easier. So I set out equals sample texture 2D, and it ask, it's asking for text, text sampler, and UV. So I need to add those inputs. So I can come up here and add myself a text input, and that is of type texture 2D. And now I'm gonna add myself a texture sampler, and that is type sampler state. And I'm also gonna add a UV, and that's gonna be a vector two. All right, so now I need to give it a texture and we're just gonna use this distortion texture here. I need to give it some UV coordinates. So I'm gonna plug in my UV node and bam, there's my texture and I can plug that into base color and get a texture sample. Pretty simple. All right, uh, the thing that we talked about in Unreal that was kind of interesting is that you can do loops. So if I copy this code here, what's happening here is I have a float T value and a T is set to zero. And then I do this loop and I do the loop four times and each time I add 0 0.25 to T. And so by the end of it, T is gonna be equal to one. So I'm just gonna copy this code here Let's, let's actually make ourselves a new custom function node. And we'll give ourselves an output port. Just call this out. And we'll set it to use a string. And I'll paste that code in. And now you can see that the result is white. T starts out as a value of zero and then it loops through this code four times. So it gets 0 0.25 added to it four times, and the result is a value of one. So with this code here, I'm able to do this loop. I set an integer value to zero. I say to do this code while the integer value is less than four, and then I add one to the integer value each time the loop goes. So by the time it's done four loops, it comes up here and it says, oh, my value is four. I'm no longer less than four, so stop doing the loop. And that's how for loops work. Now, one of the most interesting things to be able to do um, in a custom function node is these loops because you can't do loops with just uh, nodes in the shader graph. Maybe someday uh, you'll be able to add uh, some kind of mechanism for doing loops. But uh, for now, if you want to do a loop, uh, like a for loop like this, or a while loop, for example, you have to use a custom function node. So we have this other bit of code here that actually does blurring. And what this is doing is a for loop 
but inside the for loop, we're sampling our texture four times and offsetting it a little bit to the left, right, top, and bottom. So that's what this is doing here. It's offsetting uh, to the left, to the right, to the top, and the bottom. So I'm just gonna copy this shader code and I'm gonna paste it into our custom function. And this code requires uh, text, let's see, TEX, and we're gonna set this to a texture 2D. It require, requires a text sampler, and we're gonna set this to sampler state. It also needs UV coordinates, so we're gonna set that to UV, and we're gonna set these uh, to vector two. And then it requires an R value, which is a float, and it requires a dist value, which is also a float. So for, for the R value, I'm just gonna set that to eight to begin with, and then we'll set our dist value to 0 .1, 0 0.01. And then let's find a texture again. Let's use our distortion texture again, like we were before. Oh, it looks like there's an error. Maybe I made a mistake here. Yep, I found the problem. I don't have a UV coordinate input. I think I may have added one, but it didn't work quite the way that I wanted. Here's my UV coordinates. We're gonna set it to vector two, and I'll just move it up here to this location. And now we need to add some UVs. So I'm gonna add a UV node to bring in my UV coordinates and plug them in. Oh, and I've got my output value set to a float and I actually need it to be a vector three. So there we go. And now what I can do is I can use my uh, radius value and my distance value to control uh, the amount of blur that's happening. The higher the distance value, the blurrier that my texture is gonna become. So if I make this uh, a value of one, well, one, it's not gonna be blurry at all because it's just gonna wrap right around. But if I make it a value of 0.5, you can see it's getting kind of blurry there. And maybe a value of 0 0.05, <laughs> wow. Okay, uh, and then we can up the number of samples that we're doing here uh, to make the, blurry, the blurriness a little bit smoother. Um, I wonder if I have a better texture for showing this off. Let me see if I can find something else. Okay, I found this kind of spiky star pattern here, and we're gonna try to blur this one instead. So if I set my samples to like a value of eight, yeah, there we go. Now you can see a little bit better what it's doing. So um, for each sample, it's either gonna be, or so for each loop of my for loop, uh, it's gonna sample to the left, to the right, to the top, and to the bottom. And it's gonna be offset uh, by this amount here. So. Um, the further down we turn this, the less blurry it's going to be. And also this is going to control the distance away. Um, and the higher that I set this value, the more samples it's going to be. So uh, 16 here um, times four samples is going to be uh, 64 samples. So I want to be kind of careful that this isn't too high. But then if our distance value um, is is too big, it kind of pulls itself apart. So uh, we have to kind of balance the value that we're using here with uh, the value that we're using here. Okay, so if we set the, the number of samples here to two, and then we set the, uh, the distance to like 0 0.25, now you can see what's happening. So it's doing a sampling from the left, the right, the top and the bottom, and um, so the higher we make this value go, uh, the more samples it's doing, and we probably want to turn this one down. Yeah, so you can see kind of the way that it's working. The problem with this method, though, is that it's just doing left, right, top, and bottom, and what we actually want to do is kind of sample around in a circle. So I have some other code over here that I've written um, that can do that, and just like I showed in Unreal, uh, let's go ahead and use this instead. So I replaced all of the Texture 2D sample instances here with Sample Texture 2D. And I, instead of using return, like I did here, now I'm setting out equals O. And so we'll come over here and just replace this code with that. 
And there are a couple of new values that I need. So I have my text, my text sampler, and my UV. But this is going to tell me that I have an undeclared identifier size. So let's set this to size. And now it's telling me I need a uh, texture resolution. So I'm going to call this text res. And now I need to set my texture resolution to vector two. And I need also a new one for the number of directions. All right, and we're going to set directions to 16. And I'm going to set my texture resolution to 512 by 512. And let's set our size to eight. And then I'm also going to need a quality input. And so I'll add quality in here. And we're going to set our quality to three. All right, so now we have a really nice blur. Um, this blur is actually kind of like a radial blur instead of just left, right, top and bottom. And the way that it works, um, just like I explained before, it's doing this sine and cosine thing, which means it's, um, for every sample, it's kind of rotating these around in a circle. And the number of circles that it's doing is determined by this quality value. And then the number of samples in each circle is, is defined by this direction value. So it's kind of got layers of circles. Um, if we set our quality to zero, it just has one circle, and then if we set it to one, it has two circles and then three. Um, so it keeps adding additional rings kind of going out from the center. Um, and then we can control like uh, the size of the blur or how blurry it is uh, with this size value here. I'm just gonna go ahead and add uh, a slider value for that size, um, just so we can kind of see what it's doing. Um, this is nice to be able to visualize in real time. So I've got my slider. I'm going to set the maximum to eight there and then wire that into size. And now you can see um, this is like the size of the blur kernel. It will set the maximum to 16. So the bigger it is, um, the, the more, the further apart things get, you can see that uh, the size value is um, blurring it more and more. All right, so that's kind of the basics of how to use HLSL code in Unreal and Unity. Uh, each of them have this custom node that allow you to uh, type your code right here into this window. Uh, of course, in, in Unity, you can also set it to use a file so you can type your code into uh, another file and use like a, a code editor, for example. It's a little bit easier to, to use a text editor than to to use these little, like these tiny text boxes. Uh, so that's why Unity allows you to do that. Um, but anyway, you are able to use the custom function node here and then also in Unreal to overcome some of the weaknesses inherent in a node-based editor. Uh, you can use it to cut down the amount of spaghetti. Uh, if you have just a math formula that you wanna type in, instead of wiring uh, you know, a couple dozen nodes together, you can just type in one line of, of a math formula and it makes things a little bit cleaner and neater um, also if you get code from somebody else that you want to use directly without having to translate it that's another great use case anyway let me know down in the comments if there's something specific that you'd like to you'd like me to show uh, using the custom function node and i'd be happy to try to get that put together in a future video Anyway, thanks a lot for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next week.